there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're so glad that you can join us for this Bible study. We're going to be starting a new study today, and the study is going to be in 1 Timothy, Paul's first letter to Timothy, his mm -hmm. son in the faith. And this is going to be a line-by-line -line study. We're going to go through the entire book. So in addition to having your Bible, it would probably be a good idea to have note paper, pen, paper, so you can jot down notes, questions. Or, um, and again, I want to remind you that we're, we're always want to welcome you to contact us with any comments or suggestions or questions that you might have at office at BibleTalk.com. This study in Timothy, I mean, it's really a powerful study. Remember that, that Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, had been chosen by Paul basically to pastor and lead the church in Ephesus, which was one of the most vital churches in the New Testament. And in his teaching to Timothy, he says in, this, in the second letter that what he is teaching Timothy he is giving him, and Timothy should then pass it on to others mm -hmm. so that they can pass it on to others. You know, we've talked about the fact that Christianity is supposed to be viral. Exactly. And this is a real example of that. Paul teaching Timothy, Timothy teaching us. And we should be taking this out and, and blessing others with it. Mm -hmm. So as I said, we're going to start. We're going to start right at the beginning of 1 Timothy. But before we do that, I, I want to pray and ask God's blessing on our time. Lord, it's our great desire to see you more clearly, that we might be more and more like you. Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts so we would have understanding of what Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke to Timothy for him to pass along, that we would receive it, and we would receive it with understanding. And Lord God, it would be, it would be the the passion of our heart to share this word, this love with others that we come in contact with, particularly in these perilous last days. So Lord, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the presence spiritually of your son, Jesus Christ, who said that we're two or more gather in his name. He is in their midst. Hallelujah. So Lord, open the eyes of our heart in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and an amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, so we're going to write through this verse by verse. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm going to read the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. When Paul talks about being an apostle, he's not boasting in his position. This is not what he has written on his business card. No. This is just, just the ministry that God has called him to, that God has commanded him to. Right. An apostle of Christ Jesus is according to the commandment of God. You know, I don't think that Paul chose this role, he was chosen. Mm -hmm. And that became clear on that road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus Christ risen for the first time. It's not bad to desire it, and Paul talks about that here in Timothy. You know, it's like Isaiah, the, Isaiah the prophet, when he was in the, in the time of Uzziah the king. It says he had a vision. He was, in the, he was in that temple, in the Holy of Holies, and he saw the Lord God high and lifted up. His crane filled the temple. And when the Lord was saying, who can we send? There's Isaiah saying, here am I, send me, send me. <clears throat> we should desire to be used by God. Absolutely. We should be desiring to be used by God for His glory, for His purpose, not for our glory. Amen. And when He wants you to do that, He will, he will not suggest, He will not invite, He will command you to do it. He is Lord. He's God. Okay? Because He has a plan... And if you're a part of that plan, it's going to get done. And it says in the Word that He has made everything for its purpose. purpose. He has made you for a purpose. And that purpose is to be used by Him here on this planet. 
if he had no purpose to use you here, he would bless you by taking you home. That's right. Okay. Now, look at this. It says, the commandment of God, our Savior. Mm -hmm. Now, if I ask you, who's our Savior? I, I would say that 99% of Christians would say Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. But this is saying God the Father is our Savior. Mm -hmm. God our Savior. And Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Salvation came from the Father by giving the gift of His Son, Christ Jesus. It, it's, I think it's one of the mysteries of the kingdom, one of the mysteries that we... And a mystery is not to be something you can figure out. We're not even supposed to lean on our own understanding. But we should grow in understanding this mystery of the Trinity. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The highest command, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. But that very word in, in Deuteronomy, for one, is where something comes together and is more, more than one becomes one. Right. It's the same word that God used when he brought the woman to, to Adam and said, made them one. Do they have a word for one, singular one? Yeah, of course. But it's not the word that's used there. The word that's used in, in Genesis and, and, and in the Deuteronomy, the Great Commandment, is, in Hebrew is echad, and echad is, is one, but made up of, of multiple parts, okay? So I, it's trying to find that right relationship because they're not competing with one another. No. no. And they are one. I mean, this, this is the mystery of the faith, right? But the fact is, God the Father is our Savior. Yes. And he saved us by offering the gift of his son, Christ Jesus. And we received that by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? So Paul writes in this very letter, like I said, if it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. So it should be our heart that we desire to serve God, all right? But it is still God who appoints ministries in the church. They're not, they can't be self-appointed. No. Yeah. And I, I believe that's a problem in this day and age. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of self-appointed ministries, all right? It's 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28, where it says God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets. He appoints it. It's his selection. Desire it and pray that he shows you his purpose. We, we spent a lot of time, not, not long ago, <coughs> doing a study on ministry here. And the very fact that every Christian has a ministry. We're all called. We all have purpose. We're all called to ministry. So you need to pray and seek God to find out what your purpose is, what your ministry is, and then you need to fulfill it. And whatever God calls you to, he will equip you for. And there is no such thing as an unimportant ministry. If God calls you to it, it's because he has a real purpose for it, right? So let me not delay and just go on. The third and fourth verses I'm going to read now. Now remember, he's writing to Timothy. Mm -hmm. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So, Paul left Timothy there in Ephesus to instruct people, right? Mm -hmm. Not to teach strange doctrines. What's a strange, strange doctrine? Other than the gospel. Other than the gospel. You know, Isaiah says, if they don't speak according to the law and the prophets, it's because they have no dawn in them, there's no light in them. People have to speak according to the Word of God. It's got to line up with the, with the Word of God. And it should always be tested by the Word of God. How many times have I said that here? Yes, and I say it to you once again. Don't trust me. Test me. Mm -hmm. Test the things that I say against the Word of God. Paul called the Bereans more noble-minded mm -hmm. right. than the Thessalonians because they didn't take his word for anything. They checked it he, out. He would teach them something and they get right into the Scriptures and check to make sure it was mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Right? Strange doctrines are anything that don't line up with the Word of God. Right. 
But I want to I want to put you in mind of I don't know how familiar you are with Acts 19, which is kind of the initial history of the church in Ephesus. This is where Paul is in Ephesus. Paul, I mean, there were riots in Ephesus. Why? Yes, because he was bothering their business. He was bothering their business Mm -hmm. because religion was the business of Mm -hmm. Ephesus. This is where the magnificent temple of Diana or Artemis, depending on whether you're looking for the Latin or Greek name here, right? But she she was the, the primary goddess of, of the area, of, of the Roman Empire, one of the primary goddesses. And industry had built up around her. If you don't think there's industry built up around religion, go, go, go take a, a, a look and open, ask God to open your eyes to see what's going on, the reality of what's going on. So there were... There were so many people, the industry of Ephesus, mm-hmm. a great industry of Ephesus, was making religious bubbles, trinkles, Trinket, trinkets, trinkets yeah. little idols, idols. Yeah. and Paul disrupted that. Mm-hmm. The people who were getting saved, it talks about the fact, because they were, they were taking their idolatry, idolatrous mm-hmm. things and bringing them and burning them, destroying them. They weren't going to give them away and pass them on to somebody else, right. so they were destroying them. So a great uproar occurred there in Ephesus because of this. Paul was making a mess out of their business, Mm -hmm. right? So there were a lot of strange doctrines because they were all (laughs) pagan teachings that were so commonplace there in Greece, in Macedonia, in in Turkey. I mean, that's what's modern-day Turkey to Asia is where Ephesus was. The seven churches of Revelation are all in that area, right? So... He was concerned about the church taking in pagan pagan practices mm. and doctrines and teachings. And passing them <clears throat> on as they were from the word. Well, because they could be they could be dressed in religion religious clothes. Right. And I will tell you, if you study church history <clears throat> and look at what happened in the time of Constantine and right beyond, how when when Christianity wound up becoming the religion of the state when it became mixed in with the state mm. that in order to appease all of these pagans who were being basically compelled to come into Christianity they started they talked about baptizing the idols I mean it was like you know they were making they were making saints of half of the pagan gods mm. we need to be prayerful and careful about that now because you know our our honor and glory have to be given to our God, not to anybody else. He receives all the glory and honor. Yes, yes, Paul about that, right? <clears throat> so, what is the instruction that he is supposed to leave then, as opposed to those strange doctrines? Well, the fifth verse tells you. First Timothy one five says, mm. "But the goal of our instruction is love." from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the purpose that we grow in in our knowledge of the Word. Because the more we grow in our knowledge of the Word, the more clearly we see Jesus, the more we will be like Jesus, and God is love. Because none of those other religions has love. No, it winds up being Mm self-love. Everything is self-motivated. And as we, you know, we'll see someday, we get into the second letter to Timothy, and he talks about the, the signs of the last days. The very first one is men will be lovers of self. Mm-hmm. And everything has a, a selfish motivation. Christianity is exactly the opposite. Yes. The only motivation is love of others. Love of God and love, mm-hmm. excuse me, love of others. Mm-hmm. The goal of our instruction is love. It's important that you recognize the fact that that's instruction not suggestion. Mm. God is not into making suggestions. Mm. I think I think we treat him that way <clears throat> oftentimes. It's instruction, it's not advice. He's not giving us a choice. We are disciples of a master, the master, not clients of an advisor, a mentor. Oh oh. That's why they were called disciples. That word mentor has invaded the the church today so much. 
And I think people don't realize what that, you know, they do things without understanding. Mm-hmm. Mentor is, is a, 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 I'm going to say a fictional character. He came from Homer's Odyssey, you know, the, the mm-hmm. Odyssey, the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? Mm-hmm. And um, Odysseus, who was the king of Macedonia, had a son. His, te- his son's name was Telemachus. I think that's how you pronounce it. His young son. So when Odysseus went off to war in Troy, the Trojan Wars, mm-hmm. he, he asked, he, he instructed this guy, mentor, a person, to stay and be an advisor to his son. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. And that's where the word mentor comes from. He was just he was an the advisor. advisor. But understand the relationship. Mentor is the advisor to the king's okay. son, yeah. the ruler, right? Mm-hmm. If I were to say, you know, you got God the Father and you got Jesus Christ. Who's giving advice to Jesus? Well, but the point is, that's a wrong relationship. Jesus doesn't have any mentors in his life. No. And we have we don't have any mentors in our life either. No. Because he's not, like I said, he's not giving us advice. Advice, if you have a fine, and listen, I'm not saying that advice is wrong. No. That's getting good counsel is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a financial advisor, if you, if you have a problem with your car, you go to, some, to a mechanic to get advice, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But if a mechanic gives you advice, you're not obligated to take it. And well, advice is different than instruction? Yeah. Advice mm-hmm. is optional. Right. Okay. Right. You, your doctor, that's why I say if you have a, you know, you get to hear something from your doctor you don't want to hear, go get a second opinion. Mm-hmm. Because he's giving you advice, and that advice may be good advice. But the fact is, it's optional. You're not under obligation to follow it. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ says something to you, trust me, you are under obligation to follow it. Because a mentor doesn't have any authority in your life. No, it, it's not, a, he doesn't have authority. Mm-mm. Think about what was Jesus at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. What did he say? I'll, I'll, I'm glad you asked that. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, that's verses 19 to 20. Mm-hmm. All that I commanded you. Jesus is not making, he's not making suggestions. No. He's not giving advice. He is giving commands. If, if that's not true, if you don't understand that, then he is not truly Lord in your life. Exactly. And if he's not Lord in your life, you're in you're trouble. In trouble. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Mm-hmm. So seek God about that. Okay? You should desire instruction. So when God speaks something, and he can speak it through Paul, he can speak it through Peter, he can speak it through Timothy, he can speak, because all scripture is God breathed, right? Mm-hmm. We're obligated to follow that word. It's not an option. So when that didn't happen, let's go on in, in verse, I'm going to read verses six and seven now. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Mm. Mm. A lot of people want to be teachers. But I was talking about you you better be fulfilling the purpose that God called you to. Okay? Otherwise, it winds up being what they're, what they're teaching is fruitless discussion. That's the um, speculations. Well, it, it is, <clears throat> right? Or They've turned aside to fruitless discussion. This fruitless discussion means you're talking about stuff that doesn't bear fruit. It has no. It's not bringing forth the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not bringing forth fruit. It's not. What's the first? What was the first command of God? Go forth, bear fruit, bear, go forth and multiply. <laughs> well, you're right. I mean, yeah. Genesis one twenty eight says this. God blessed them. This is the Adam and the woman, right. and God said to them. Be, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on earth. Genesis 128. 
God <clears throat> took Adam and formed him out of the dust of the earth and then put him in the garden and then said it's not good for the man to be alone put him to sleep <laughs> took a rib out and made a woman right it just I, I this is an aside I just distract myself here sometimes <laughs> well because I, I've seen on in the news lately and some uh, maybe it's Discovery or a History Channel or a National I don't know what they're talking about they think they found the roots of, of the Garden of Eden oh, really? where man was created. What do you think about that? I don't think they'll find it. After the flood, good luck. Well, no, <laughs> let me tell you that. There's, there is a, a, a fallacy built into that because man was not created in the Garden of Eden. That's right. He was placed in the Garden. He was formed and then pla- he was made. Uh-huh. God breathed life into him and then... Place. Placed him in the garden. He could have been, for all I know, he could have been, he could have been, the first man may have been made in Oboka, New Jersey. I mean, you know, the only thing I can tell you, nobody can tell you where he was formed. The only thing we can tell you is where he was not formed. Right. And that was in the Garden of Eden. Right. Hello? That's an aside, but. <laughs> all right. I got a question. It says in verse 6. For some men strain from these things. Which things are these things? Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they're getting away from the sound doctrine and, and getting involved in... Uh, strange doctrines. Strange doctrines. And anything that doesn't line up with the Word of God is, 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 is strange. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, be, so why are they doing that? They want to be teachers. Why do they want to be teachers? Because they seem to be exalted in the church, and they shouldn't be. No. All right. There's every every part of the body of Christ is important. As a matter of fact, I don't see anything about you know God warning you: be careful you don't become a servant. Don't be careful you don't become a. No. a yeah. But it does say, "Let not many of you become Jesus. teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment." Isn't that what it says? James three one. Mm-hmm. So while we are all called, every one of us is called to encourage one another, as it says in Hebrews chapter three. Mm-hmm. So you know we're, we're called. To, what do you? What do you? How do you encourage one another? With the word, word of God. Right. But having a Facebook account doesn't make you a teacher. Yeah. There's a difference between sharing the word, encouraging one another, and trying to teach the word. Mm-hmm. Not everybody is called to be a teacher. But like I said, it seems you look at Facebook and everybody's a teacher. I, I used to say I, I did business seminars for, for years, a long time ago, on biblical principles. And I always say, I just want you to think about this. And I would ask people, you know, this is, this is actually uh, before the, the Internet became a thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I'd say, you know, how many of you here have like a ballpoint pen? Do you own a ballpoint pen? Mm-hmm. You have greater technology than William Shakespeare ever dreamt of. That's right. So where's the play? <laughs> it wasn't the technology. It's not the technology. Mm-mm. The technology is a means, but it's what God has put in you and what God has called you to do, right? Why? They want to be teachers, but he says, but God says they don't understand, Right? Isn't that what Paul said, mm-hmm. right? Straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers, even though they do not understand either what they're saying and the matters about what they make confident assertions. They don't understand. There's a difference between revelation and understanding. Do you know that? Revelation, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Revelation, these are things, there's a lot of things. Did you ever buy a car? You ever have a car? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's a revelation. Somebody hands you a key. You go put the key in. You turn the thing. And bada bing, the, thing, the no- engine starts making noise and you can drive away. Right. Does that work for you? Yes, it does. Do you understand how a combustion engine, internal combustion engine works? Mm, not, not completely, no. Not completely? No. I know the pistons got to go up and down. they got to fire Well, up. there you go. She knows the pistons <laughs> go up and down. The spark plugs have to close the... But it'll work for you, right? Yeah. 
You can have a revelation of something. You can go turn on the light switch. You, when you're a little kid, you learn that, you know, you throw that switch yeah. and something happens. Lights go on. Cats can learn that. <laughs> right. It doesn't mean <laughs> having, having that revelation doesn't mean that you have understanding of it. There's a lot of things that have been revealed to us that we don't understand in the Word. Or we should be growing in understanding. That's why it says in Proverbs that we should be seeking understanding. Yes. Because if you don't understand, what are you going to do here? I mean, you, you're going to be teaching, you're going to be, you can be teaching falsehoods without even being aware of it. I, I, want to, I want to move along here, though. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11 now, right? Mm -hmm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals, and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Right? Yes. Now, Paul starts by saying, we know that the law is good. Well, I, I know a lot of Christians that don't think the law is good mm -hmm. because they don't have an understanding of something. We're not under the law anymore. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the law is not good. No, it was for a purpose. Think about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches him, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew five seventeen through 19. So I'm not getting that. But what do you know? I mean, when it comes to, I'm, I'm put in mind, I think I mentioned this to you the other day, of Donald Rumsfeld. You know Donald Rumsfeld? Mm -hmm. Donald Rumsfeld yeah. was the U.S. Secretary of Defense. And in a news briefing in 2002, he made this statement. There are known knowns. These are the things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That's to say that there are things we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. These are the things we don't know we don't know. <laughs> That's a headache. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. It's actually a very sound statement. But I'll tell you what, don't let it go by you too fast because it'll knock your head in the oblivion. <laughs> we, we need to know the Word of God. We need to know... We need to have confidence in what God has shown us, mm -hmm. what we know from the and Word. He's given us understanding of. But understanding becomes key. Mm -hmm. The law is good. This is Paul saying this. Now, if ever there was anybody in the New Testament <clears throat> who you might think is anti-law, mm -hmm. it would be the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Because he is the one that does the most teaching about the fact that the law doesn't save us. Mm -hmm which is what the Jews thought at the time, that you got saved by keeping the law, by, by doing the... And Paul said, that's the not rituals, what it is. Yeah. But the fact that we don't get saved by keeping the law doesn't make the law bad. There's still... The dietary laws are for your b benefit. How mm -hmm. about you shall honor your mother and father? Is that out? In that, yeah. No. The law, it says in the Bible somewhere, the law was made for man, not man for the law. And the law was was initially there to benefit man if they would follow it. Yeah, but ultimately, you know why it was there? As a tutor to lead oh, us to Christ. Oh, oh. It's got a multifaceted purpose. Yes. It's Absolutely. got more than one purpose. Absolutely. Therefore, the law became our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. But, see, because it's faith that justifies us. Right. Not, not the law. That's what, Paul, that's what the whole letter of Romans is all about. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. All right? The law was intended to lead us to Christ, but now in Christ, the law becomes an instructor 
to reveal Christ more clearly and to train us to be like him. All scripture, and this includes Genesis 1 to the end of Deuteronomy, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16. You said the end of Deuteronomy. That's the first five books of the Bible. Yeah, I'm talking about that's what... You, yeah, that's typically considered the law, the, the Torah. That's okay. okay. But the whole... Um, so what I'm saying is in all the scripture, every, every all scripture... Well, I'm not saying it. Paul's saying it. The Word of God is saying it. All scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. Okay? He said it's good if you... The law is good. It's you only it it's only bad if you are trusting in the law to give you a right relationship with God. It can't it can't do that. But isn't he talking about the law here for, as far as evildoers? Because he said the righteous don't have to be concerned. Well, but the law was given for the ungodly, for the evildoers, yes, the murderers. To in, to instruct them to. Basically, to bind them, to confine them. Um, we've been released from the law, mm-hmm. having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not by the oldness of the letter. Mm-hmm. That's Romans, Romans 7, 6. Okay. The law is not made for a righteous person. Right. It's not that that makes the law bad. No, no. The fact is, I don't... A righteous person doesn't need the law because they do what's right. Exactly. Yeah. What's it, why? Why will a righteous person do what's right, and an unrighteous person who not? Because so the, the goal of our righteous. instruction is love, and Jesus said, you know, He said, "What are the first two commandments? Love the Lord your God with everything that you have, and, and love your neighbor. your neighbor as yourself." So if you do these two things, you fulfill the law. Yes, because I'll tell you what: we would not need all of the laws that we have for for driving. If, if people love one another. Right. But they are lovers of self. So they're not going to do the speed limit. No. They're going to be cutting in and out, doing 40 miles an hour over the speed limit because they're more important than everybody else. Okay? They, what would you call them? Self-righteous? Well, I, Self-centered. I, they're self-centered is what they are. <clears throat> lovers of self. If, if you love somebody else, I don't need a law to tell me to do what's right with that person. It's, right. it's the person who is self-centered needs to be told that there are consequences if you do not follow this command. Right, right. I, don't, I don't need a lot of laws when it comes to driving. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, that's, that wasn't always true in my life, especially, I mean, when I wasn't saved. But I, I drive safely. So, you know, if it's... I'm not going to cut people off. I don't need a law that tells me don't... You know, make sure you signal or let people know that you're going to do something because I care about them. Okay? If you are... there, We had another law. Want the other law? Mm -hmm. James talks about it. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. James 2.8. That's the royal law. Mm -hmm. That's the goal of our instruction. Okay? Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Mm. Philippians 2, 3. If you did that, you wouldn't need anybody else standing over you with a hammer or, you know, telling you, you better do this or else. You wouldn't need an or else. You'd be doing it because you want to bless that other person. And the law would become unnecessary. So Jesus is that royal law of love. Well... When we become like Jesus, you, you, you know, you'll be, you'll, your goal will be to bless others mm-hmm. because that was his goal. Right. Right? Well, you know what? I want to pick this up again next week right where we're leaving off here because we need to talk about the people that the law was made for, those who are lawless and rebellious, the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane, the people who kill their fathers and mothers, were murdered. Mm-hmm. Is that something that goes on in the world around us oh, today? Goodness, yes. Immoral men and homosexuals. Is mm-hmm. that something that goes on around us today? Absolutely. Kidnappers, liars, and perjurers. And whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Whatever else. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's not just these things. 
If you're not living your life according to the Word of God, because the Word of God is holy and pure, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy Word. If you're not keeping it according to the Word, you know what? You need the, you need the law in your life. Amen. Okay? So, join us again next week. And like I said, if you have questions or suggestions, you, 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 you want to get more involved, you can come to us and uh, write to us or visit us at our website, BibleTalk.com, or at our Facebook pages, In Search of Christianity or Bible Talk, Facebook slash Bible Talk. But get in touch. Get, let's, let's get involved. Let's share. It's, it's harder to have to do this through this technology. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, we're not able to hop around and get to every place like I'd like to. So pray for us. We'll be praying for you. And invite other people. If you know, if you see this, share it with others. Yes. If you have a Facebook page, you can get these videos. They're, they'll be on the Facebook page. And then you can share them with your friends. Because it is ever so important in these days that people hear the Word of God. Amen. Because it's coming, or it's happening now, a famine for hearing the Word of God. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. <clears throat> We thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord God, that you are patient, desiring that none should perish. And it's for that reason and that reason only that the end has yet to come. Lord, help us all to be faithful, as Paul was faithful in fulfilling his ministry. Help us to take that love that you've poured into our hearts through your Holy Spirit and touch every life that we possibly can with your love, your power, your word, Use us, Lord, but use us for the glory of your name. We ask in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, till next week. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the one of your mind.